Thank you very much, Dr. Arvind Gupta ji. It's a great pleasure for me to speak in front of such a brilliant audience and so encouraging for me. When we talk of uh, Indo-Chinese relations and especially when I'm going to talk about Kumarajiva, the first photograph that you can see here is a sandstorm. When I was traveling there, we were almost caught into that just escaped and when I was there I was so touched because of the desert because of the difficulties our people would have faced at that time these days we travel by air-conditioned cars stay in hotels have good food everything is available but still we say oh the journey was so difficult so what was that time when there was nothing, no such cars, no such hotels, no such guides, how they were traveling in this, in this, uh, on this route, it's not a road. So, so many times they were lost in the desert without water, without nothing to eat and there were so, so many people died on that during the, uh, during the journeys and their horses used to die, their camels were, dead. so there was so much, so much suffering and still they were doing it. When I reached uh, uh, the birthplace of Kumarajiva, I picked up some stone and sand from there as a souvenir. Although I was a bit scared, maybe I will be caught in the, in the customs when I'm leaving China, but still I took it and I brought them as souvenirs because these are the people who have spread Indian culture, who made India so great and these are the people because of whose efforts today we we proudly say that India was the cultural leader of the world. So today I'm going to talk about Kumarajiva. In my earlier talks, uh, there was a one talk was just general about India-China relations. The second was on Indian teachers, Indian monks, Indian scholars in China. Then the third was Chinese scholars who came to India and who translated the Sanskrit text because they are the basic. They laid the foundation of our relationship. And then the third was on Silk Route because Silk Route connects India and China. At that time, there was nothing Chinese on the Silk Route. All these kingdoms, small kingdoms, whatever has been discovered from there, it's all Indian. You talk of literature, you talk of inscriptions, you talk of philosophy in the monasteries, the temples, the people who were staying there, whatever has been discovered, because they are all ruined after the Islamic invasions. So whatever has been discovered is all fragmented. It's all scattered. And whatever fragments are discovered from there are preserved in various uh, museums and uh, collections uh, in many countries that I talked about in my earlier earlier talk. So, this Kumarajiva is one of the three most important translators. B why? Because the way he translated was so easy to understand. Why he could do it? Why he was so different from Xuanzang and other other scholars. Why he is uh, revered till today all over East Asia. In Japan, I received from Japan, I received uh, 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 some information about Buddhist monasteries and temples in Japan. According to their data, there are 75,000 Buddhist temples and 65,000 out of them are based on the philosophy of those texts which were translated by Kumarajiva. You go to Japan, people know about Kumaraju. They don't call it Kumarajiva, they, they say Kumaraju. So, he's, he's, uh, he stands out uh, by virtue of his, uh, the way he translated and the level of his translation was so great. Uh, this Kumarajiva uh, is, is his, his, uh, he's important because his translations are important because as people accept in China that the practical Buddhism in East Asia is basically established by Kumarajiva. He represents an international personality. How and why? His father, his name was Kumarayana. 
he was a kashmiri brahman who became a monk who was from the, from a family uh, from which many people had become like uh, today's in today's terms you can say uh, uh, prime ministers so he was from that level of family and uh, he became a monk he wanted to uh, spread the dharma and he started traveling towards uh, central asia and then he was planning to go to china but on the way he was stopped in kucha because the king of kucha was searching uh, uh, a match for the for his sister and uh, so far they could not have anybody so brilliant so dedicated so knowledgeable so de devo devoted to buddhism and all these qualities they could not find so when they saw all those qualities in kumarayana the king forced him to stay there and leave the robes of a monk and he was forced to marry the princess her name was jiva so the son born with this uh, the, by these parents one uh, was indian from the kashmiri family kashmiri brahman and the other was the princess of kucha so it is uh, both of them gave parts of their names to the boy kumarayana from kumarayana he was given kumara and from the mother's name jiva he got jiva so he became kumara jiva so he was a kuchian he could speak uh, kuchian is kuchian of course and it is said to be an europe it, uh, a european language so reading discussing all this he could do and then he was uh, he was a very uh, good scholar of sanskrit also he had studied all the sanskrit texts with from vedas onwards and he was well versed into the indian philosophy into the especially the texts and by the time he i will come later to it that by the time he reached china he did not know much chinese although people sometimes say that he knew chinese but i don't think so so he was a great philosopher he had a long cherished mission that was propagation of buddhism he traveled through the barren lands as i said he came to he came to india also uh, again there is a controversy because in according to his biography he came to kashmir but what was kashmir at that time is a is a, is a question and many scholars interpret the word jibin differently some scholars say that jibin was more of bactria some scholars accept that jibin was that included kashmir also but whatever was this he traveled from at a very early age uh, he was brought by his mother to india to kashmir and first they went to kashgar i am coming to it so whatever he has created is is a pure boundless wisdom that is incredible that he the way he he uh, uh, translated the sutras his knowledge as i said was so great was so encyclopedic you can say and his fluency in sanskrit and also later on when he studied chinese he became so proficient in chinese language also so a person who was proficient in both the language could internalize the philosophy of the buddhist texts or the text whatever he translated easily deeply and he recreated the text he did not do a word to word translation which was earlier done or later done you can say for example shwensang the translations done by shwensang are difficult to understand the fluency that is required for a reader is not there it becomes difficult to understand it becomes uh, uh, also sometimes people don't like to study more but kumara jiva stands out like a like a gem in all the other great translators he has translated for 54 texts in a distinctive fl flowing smoothness he 
his his translations as i said earlier that meaning is more important conveying the meaning and the essence of those texts was more important for the for kumara jiva so that is why because of his brilliance he is remembered from generations to generations almost all over east asia what has contributed to china not just because of the translations but otherwise also i am coming to it later on uh here you can just have a view of the um, the desert how it became it was so difficult the route was so difficult the um, how the chinese and the indian monks they carried the sutras and uh, they influenced all these kingdoms the monasteries were uh, built in almost all these small uh, uh, kingdoms so kucha was one of them this is one of the biographies the uh, here is one of the biographies of kumara jiva very little has been discovered as biography of kumara jiva from china nothing from india we have forgotten such a great uh, philosopher such a great uh, master who contributed so much this is from this is discovered from dunhuang you see i just wanted to show you a few pictures of the desert the sky is pure it's pure blue but you can see the clouds but they don't rain how these people were traveling kumara jiva's father left the comforts of his family and he strapped a wooden image of shakyamuni to his back and set out to this journey along the silk road he traveled through the uh, northern route the route meets first it bifurcates if you go from india to central asia the route first bifurcates at kashgar kashgar is known as kashi even in the modern maps of china this is something very amazing and kashgar was a place there is only one reference that is given in the biography of kumara jiva that he went to kashgar to study vedas that means kashgar was a center of teaching of studying vedas but today when you enter kashgar it was a shocking scenario when i entered kashgar oh i could see only the shops with knives with the smallest size to the biggest size of knives and people told me that from there the uh, border of pakistan is just 100 kilometers why these people are manufacturing so many knives and for whom was a big question in my mind i could see almost nothing i took many photos from those shops so here is uh, uh, here is uh, a stupa here is a stupa from uh, the birthplace of kumara jiva i will show you one more most of the all the monasteries not most all of the monasteries are in ruins along the silk road whatever may be the reasons first uh, reason is the invasions the islamic invasion the german delegates the german explorers the german archaeologists who have traveled along the silk road they have written shocking stories according one of the books i was reading by a german scholar Uh, about silk road that when they when the when the group reached there they were told by the local people the villagers uh, they they were feeling very sorry that they came that they came that they reached their place so late they told them that just a few days ago two truck loads of manuscripts were thrown into the river there are two rivers yurungash and karakash uh some that i have to check and uh, it means that 
Rec till recent times, these monasteries were being destroyed. I have been to many of them while traveling on the Silk Road, and I could see how they were destroyed. Uh, in the same book, it is written that these people, the villagers, they were told by the invaders that if you don't destroy these images, the statues, the paintings on the walls, then they will destroy their your crops and yourself also. So the whole village used to go to these cave complexes and destroy them and i could see the marks in the in the eyes and the mouth of those faces of those wall paintings so this is another story and it is said they have written that also that uh, people used to sit in the near the rivers on the river banks with sieves to collect gold because most of them, these images, these statues were covered by gold and many of the large number of manuscripts were gold uh, covered with gold or written with gold ink. So gold used to flow into the rivers and people used to sit and collect them. So um, this is just a small map. There can be a bigger one to show uh, the, the, this, uh, the area. And I just wanted to show you Kucha here. Can you see this map? Sorry, I can't see here. So uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, you can see how the, uh, the road bifurcates at Kashgar and uh, one route goes to the north and one goes via south. So this is, the, these routes are called the northern silk route and the southern silk route and they again meet at Dunhuang. So Dunhuang has been a great place of Indian culture. I will give one talk on the caves also and I will like to uh, include Dunhuang. Dunhuang was also a commandery. And uh, beyond, the, beyond the Great Wall of China, it Singh, one of the Chinese pilgrims, he has written when he was coming to India uh, that he has written that beyond Great Wall of China, there was nothing Chinese. It was all Indian. This is another pagoda. This is uh, the, the place where he was born is called Subashi. This is from Subashi. The place where he was born is a pagoda here. These are the caves, this, uh, the, the, the small kingdom. This is called Kizil. It is very close to Kucha. We travel to this place also. And here the dot-like things, what you see like niches in the mountains, they are all caves. And inside the caves, there are beautiful, marvelous paintings. And why this? There was a question when I was shown these caves and uh, as an expert on China, Chinese art and philosophy and uh, uh, my comparison of uh, Chinese art with the philosophical texts, etc. They were quite impressed uh, and they could, they showed me happily the caves which they don't open to anybody. Chinese are very uh, strict about it whatever they want to show to the outsider to the foreigners only that part is shown whether you go to Dunhuang you are a scholar you are doing whatever you are doing but they don't permit you to enter whatever you want to do so he told me that Marianne was there one of the archaeologists who was accompanying our group he said even Marianne was here Marianne was a uh, I don't know whether she is still uh, the director general of the uh, museum of uh, this Asiati Kunst in Germany in Berlin uh, but when she was there because they had a very good collection from Kizil and uh, they have beautifully displayed it uh, so they said even Marianne was there and we did not show the key these caves were to her what we are showing to you because they wanted some interpretation from me. How do I interpret the caves? Why they were built? Why they were carved out? So my impression after uh, entering into a number of caves, what I could see there was one similar thing in almost all the caves that you have a cave. You enter it, in front you have something, there was some statue which is lost now. We do not know what was there because it, all, it is all ruined. Behind that, when you go, like uh, when you circumambulate that area, then behind there is a, a huge statue of Buddha in Parinirvana. Lying, sleeping Buddha. 
then uh, after looking at all the murals on the walls uh, because what i could feel is that they are showing something like a paradise where the soul has gone after death because i have seen such kind of themes depicted in other paintings also in china and japan and other places and in many number of their paintings and uh, sculptures and uh, monasteries etc so i could feel that there is something about the after uh, life after death then i asked them that behind the sculpture behind the main altar is there anything where you could keep something something a box like thing then we tried to search for it and in a number of caves a number of caves i was so amazed at that we could see that niche like thing behind the statues behind that platform where the remains of the deceased person according to me would have been kept and these caves are built one after the other maybe for the royal family maybe for the aristocrats whatever they don't have any written records about it but whatever is there that is marvelous uh, i will talk i think later about the about the um, these caves what is there inside here you can see kumara jiva sitting on a on a huge lotus meditating in front of the kizil caves because he used to go to meditate in kizil kucha and kizil are nearby it's, it's not not at, at a much distance so this statue what you can see is kumara jiva that was recently carved out and set up by the, the kucha research academy kumara jiva worked as a because of the, his multilingual skills on the buddhist philosophy and uh, here you can see again the desert how he could do it again it was my question and the unique style of translating all these texts the the system that is uh, uh, that is followed by xuanzang and other chinese scholars is called koi because they were trying to find the matching concepts and matching terms for each indian philosophical term which was not possible for them but they were trying hard and they coined new terms also so this came as a contribution of india to the chinese language also that new terms in chinese language were coined because they wanted to translate the philosophical concepts which were did not exist there then there was nothing personal for kumara jiva he did not want any name or any fame but his style was is still accepted as the most artistic and the most fluent and also easy to understand that is why his texts his translations could have an such a great impact on all the fields of chinese culture whether it is literature whether it is music whether it is drama whether it is painting whatever it is and sometimes the texts were so complicated if you look at the buddhist texts and you try to read them you will see there is so much repetition sometimes so he shortened many of the texts he deleted some repetitive uh, passages and he adapted the texts the way the chinese people of literary taste could accept it then he divided the text into sections very well so that suited the chinese mind and they they accepted the translations and the translations were not done just that one person is sitting and translating it was a long process of translating there used to be 3000 or sometimes 4000 people gathered there they were invited from all over china to sit with kumara jiva and give their give their views what should be the translation how one should translate 
every word every sentence was accepted by these people and final acceptance was given by the chinese emperor emperor sometimes used to preside over these sessions and many of the chinese uh, emperors or empresses they have written four words to the translations so what happened suppose you uh, one text it is being translated there are 3000 4000 monks from all over china china at that at that time was divided into southern and northern china but because the monks were coming from all over china and as soon as the, any of the text was complete they used to take it make copies at that time they were not ma making copies with the uh, uh, xylographic style but they were making copies by hand only so it was a difficult task they made copies and took those copies to went back used to go back to their monasteries and preach those texts so that way it helped in unification of china it it became a democratic style the system became democratic only a few people in the chinese system were eligible or you can say they they could they could they could afford for higher studies but when buddhism reached there anybody anybody could study in the monasteries anybody could do whatever he wanted then another contribution of india during that period uh, when these texts were translated and copied was Uh, was uh, uh, was uh, the paper industry printing also flourished paper industry f flourished because there was so much of demand now everybody who is coming to these uh, uh, joining the translation uh, groups the bureau of translations were set up so they made copies then they when uh, suppose one monk goes to his monastery then there also people were making copies taking them home so paper industry and uh, printing printing they all flourished uh, kumara jiva uh, this is i'm showing you just one example of uh, the lotus sutra translated by kumara jiva Kum because lotus sutra is one of the most important sutras today all over east asia if you go to to japan there are so many sects that based on that are based on the philosophy of lotus sutra so one of them is soka gakkai it's so famous here in delhi also uh na, this is uh, na, this was done under the uh, patronage of emperor yao xing i'm coming to it later on first i am showing you a few things uh, this is a painting which is uh, it is very difficult to just look at this painting and just see and uh, identify that it is not paint that is used in making this but it is the sutra it is the one of the chapters of this lotus sutra that has been used 13th chapter of this lotus sutra that is written in a way that it creates a pagoda and down below in the lowest level on the ground level you can see two tiny buddhas two tiny buddhas are buddha himself and the other is called prabhut ratna prabhut ratna is a buddha of you can say prabhut means enough sufficient and ratna you know gems so he is a buddha of gems you can say this style of painting is called chitra kavya in in in, uh, in this tradition the same style of pagoda you can see here with prabhut ratna and buddha this is from japan this is from hasidera monastery it's a plaque that was made in the 7th century uh, this is still this was still worshiped in the hasidera monastery i'm not going into the details of this plaque now i come to a mural painting that is discovered from kisil you can see how amazing these are this is from the museum for indishikos it was originally uh, initially it was called indishikos now it is called asiati sikos it's from berlin the this painting and uh, here you can see buddha 
is uh, uh, it's a study of a, of the Buddha and the goddess of music. So this is the goddess of music here, and you can see the goddess of music is dark in color. Whenever there is darkness on the in the color of any of the figures in these in these cave uh, complexes, we can easily identify being an Indian. There are beautiful paintings of uh, Indian teachers also. Nobody has so far identified that who this teacher is. One of the teachers I am really fascinated by his portrait in the case, from the Kizil case. Similar, very similar. Sometimes I feel it's an exact copy of that that is discovered from Afghanistan. Somebody has to work on it. This is another copy of Lotus Sutra. Lotus Sutra, a complete copy of Lotus Sutra has been discovered from Central Asia, and uh, uh, this, it's amazing. Uh, it's an amazing discovery. So now, now I come to the texts that are translated by Kumara Jiva, and they are painted on the walls of different. Uh, caves especially. Here uh, you can see the Dunhuang caves. Uh, that there are there are many dynasties during the rule of many dynasties these paintings were um, uh, done and uh, they run into um, I don't remember how many kilometers and uh, they are beautifully preserved and what do you find there is representation of the philosophical concepts of different sutras, prominent sutras like Nirvana Sutra, like Amita Yurdhyana Sutra, Amitabha Sutra, Vimal Kirti Nirdesha Sutra. I'll give one talk on the sutras also. For uh, for example, this Vimal Kirti Sutra, uh, Nirdesha Sutra is very fascinating. The story itself is uh, is quite attractive. That there was a prince. Uh, who was uh, who was a lay devotee? He was no, he was not a monk. So what I say is, spread of Buddhism is not done only by monks. It is by lay people also. Ashoka himself was a lay person. He was not a monk. Similarly, there are so many other uh, uh, people who were not monks. So uh, I will. I think I will talk later on about uh, the story of Vimalkirti when I will talk about the Vimalkirti Nirdesha Sutra. How the sutra has a fascinating story and how the story became so important, so common, so dear to the heart of the people. How people wrote poetry on the basis of the philosophy of Vimalkirti. How his life was uh, take, uh, adopted as a as a role model by many Chinese people. They wanted to live life like Vimalakirti. So all this I think I'll talk about it later. And it has been painted in the caves of Dunhuang a number of times. I'll show you more photographs from Dunhuang later on. When, uh, when Kumara Jiva was seven years old, he was take his uh, he was taken by his mother because his mother was a devout Buddhist. She brought her him to Jipin, and whether it was Kashmir or whether it was a part of Jipin, Kashmir was a part of Jipin. That is, I'm not going into those controversies. But whatever has been written is that he was brought to Kashmir on the way. They, uh, when when they were going back, because Kashmir at that time, you know, that was a great center of learning, great center of Buddhism, Hinduism, history, philosophy, arts, what what not. So he came there. He stayed there for some time. Then they left for uh, going back. On their way back, they 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 reached Kashgar. In Kashgar, he was received by uh, the by the king himself. He has a, he had a discourse there, and uh, his fame was spreading. He met one of his teachers from Kashmir in Kashgar. He was studying. It is it is written that he studied Vedas there, and from Kashgar he goes back to Kucha, and by the time he became 20, 21 years, his fame was, he, he became so famous that the Chinese emperor wanted to capture him. It, there, is a, there is a history, uh, there are other incidents also, when the Chinese wanted to capture Sanskrit scholars, they, when they wanted to bring back 
Sanskrit manuscripts, even from even from Champa, they sent an army to bring back uh, bring back Sanskrit manuscripts because Champa was a great center of uh, Indian music, dance, philosophy. There were a large number of temples. Even there, even today, uh, according to what people tell me, that around one lakh Hindus are still there. They are very poor, and they are most of them are worshippers worshippers of Shiva because along the coastline there are all Shiva temples uh, like Somnath. Somnath is also a Shiva temple. So this is, uh, I don't want to just go into those details, but uh, um, the, so the Chinese uh, emperor, one of the emperors, he sent request to the king of Kucha to send Kumarajiva, but he did not accept. Then finally, after a few requests, he sent uh, um, a general, his name was Lu Kuang, and he brought a group, uh, he, uh, he, he um, uh, invaded Kucha, and he took Kumarajiva with him. He captured Kumarajiva. And uh, at that time, when he was taking Kumarajiva as war booty, the, he took many musicians and dancers also from Kucha. Kucha was a great center of music. Indian music had already reached China in around uh, second century BC. And uh, uh, the Saptaswara, that had reached China and they had created new music uh, on the basis of those seven notations and all. So here you can see how Kumarajiva was captured by the general uh, and uh, he, he was taken as a prisoner to China. When he reaches China, this is quite late when he reaches Chang'an. On the way, what happened? When he was going, on the way, the general who had uh, come to capture Kumarajiva, something political, there was a political instability, and uh, he put Kumarajiva in prison. He didn't take him to Chang'an, but on his way, is, uh, he kept him as a prisoner for 17 long years. And the general himself didn't know what is, why Kumarajiva was, is so important. Uh, how big scholar is he? How important is he for China? But he kept him as prisoner. And some scholars accept that when he was staying as a prisoner, he learned, he had enough of time to learn Chinese. The best time for him to learn Chinese was this. Then finally, he was released and uh, he was going to Chang'an. Chang'an is the modern Xi'an and at that time he was, it, Chang'an has been, has remained a capital of a large number of dynasties and there are a large number of tombs discovered from there. I'll talk one day about the tombs, palaces and temples also, that how faith and empire, they work together how the energies of the emperors shifted from building tombs to temples and why we have the Chinese temples are built in the style that in which they used to build the palaces. So we'll come to it later. So when he goes on his way near Dunhuang, his horse died because as I said it was so difficult a journey even for horses it's so difficult there is no water on the way so when his horse died then people collected money and they built a beautiful stupa in the memory of a horse this st it still survives there finally he reaches Chang'an and then he was received and here you can see that how he reached Chang'an, it, it is just a line drawing, there is not much that you can see here. So, um, this is an, again another line drawing which, where you can see how Kumarajiva is busy translating the sutras in Chang'an, in Xi'an and under the patronage given by Emperor uh, Yaoxing. And he was given all kinds of facilities. Even Emperor Yaoxing tried his best to keep the seed of Kumarajiva so that they could have such brilliant Chinese uh, like Kumarajiva. Kumarajiva uh, became a luminant symbol 
of the national metropolis and uh, uh, he he still is venerated there uh, there are very not many portraits of kumara jiva that we can find so that is why i am showing you one such portrait it is from a japanese collection uh, taisho zuzobu where kumara jiva is depicted as an eminent monk there are portraits of eminent monks who work for translation of sanskrit text into chinese this scroll this roll is preserved in the ninnaji monastery of kyoto this is from chang'an today also this western gate of xian uh, modern xian i have been to this place and uh, this is uh, still there this is the tomb of kumara jiva i went there and uh, now there is a huge building that has come up may built by the present government and uh, because there was a bureau of uh, translators who were working there so kumara jiva as one of them inside this tomb one can see a beautiful lantern like thing all all around there are some symbols and uh, outside uh, i'm sorry i don't have that photograph outside that there is a place where continuously smoke is coming out and nobody can could tell us why this smoke is there and inside the tomb there is a there is a statue of kumara jiva in shrine and uh, there is a painting also and the life of kumara jiva is also depicted in this uh, in this uh, in this monastery it is now a very well kept monastery and uh, they they have they have preserved beautiful uh, you can say uh, items of archival uh, importance for example the tongue of kumara jiva which did not burn when he was cremated they still have that and i could take photos of many of the things there and uh, the biography of kumara jiva painted recently although the photos were all framed but i could take photos so that i could show you uh, sorry this is uh, i think uh, we finish it here